name is David Nesbitt. I'm here to talk about Valhalla, our open source multimodal routing solution. I work at MapZen, which is a mapping laboratory based out of the Samsung Accelerator. We provide tools and open source tools and services for mapping, routing, and geocoding, all using open source data. Today, I plan to introduce our newly formed mobility team and discuss Valhalla, our open source routing solution. I am also pleased to announce that as of today, we support multimodal routing, both within Valhalla and our hosted service known as MapZen Turn by Turn. The MapZen mobility team combines the OpenStreetMap and routing expertise of the Valhalla team with the transit and urban planning expertise of the Transitland team. We feel that this combination will allow us to more readily develop tools and services to support a changing transportation landscape with things like bike share, ride share, more transit, and with cities starting to design for more walkability and bikeability, we feel that there is a need for more than just automobile routing in our solution. At MapsN, we develop tools and services aimed for use by businesses, researchers, and entrepreneurs to develop new and novel navigation and analysis applications. We also work with open data um, providers and tr uh, work to improve the quality of open street map and transit data. Okay, today we are announcing the um, launch of our worldwide multimodal open source routing solution. There are other open source routing solutions that provide worldwide coverage, and there are other open source multimodal routing solutions, but they tend to uh, have trouble scaling to worldwide coverage. We hope to, through our um, Transitland data import source, scale to uh, support many more cities and countries. We currently support New York, San Francisco, and Rome. This um, set of uh, images is from our MapSend turn-by-turn product site, and you can see some of the treatment of the transit routing uh, within these images. We support bus routing, rail transfers at stations and, and, and between stations. We have walking segments, and we even, in this example, use the Staten Island Ferry. You can see some of the treatment that we've added to the leaflet routing machine. You can notice the uh, line color, which is the color that is uh, entered by the uh, transit agencies as the, as the route line color. Um, within the narrative panel, um, you can notice the arrive time, depart time, uh, station names you know, when you're entering or leaving a station. There's uh, the route name of the, of the uh, transit uh, route you're taking. And there's head sign information for the uh, um, destination. Um, you can also see that we've um, done different line treatments for the walking segments. And we have different icons uh, to represent the modes of travel within the uh, narrative panel. So at, at MapSend, we've been developing Valhalla for about a year and a half. And I'm sorry. Um, and um, there are other open source routing solutions out there. I want to spend most of the rest of this talk discussing what makes Valhalla different and how we differentiate ourselves. Uh, the first is the global multimodal routing support. Um, another area that we differentiate ourselves is we do dynamic runtime costing, which I will demonstrate uh, applied to bicycle routing. We feel this makes our solution more flexible and extensible across a wide range of routing modes and uh, options. We, we uh, form our data into routing graph tiles, analogous to how mapping data is put into tiles. 
Uh, I will discuss some of the benefits of this, but the primary ones are optimizes memory use and allows use of Valhalla within, with lower memory devices and even embed it onto phones and, and tablets. Uh, we feel that offline routing capabilities are, are one of the strengths. And the last piece is our improved guidance. We worked from day one to provide uh, suitable guidance and, and uh, navigation information, and I'll provide some examples of that. You can see all of this on our uh, GitHub organization page uh, under Valhalla. This is our team in our cozy office in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm the engineering lead, but I rely heavily on uh, the rest of the team who I've worked with uh, for many years. Uh, Dwayne Gerhardt I've worked with for almost 16 years. Um, before coming to maps and even. Um, Greg Nisley is our OSM and transit data expert. Dwayne Gerhart is um, our expert with uh, guidance and narrative and analyzing route quality. Kristen DeLuca develops our service interfaces and Kevin Kreiser is our system architect. Our source of data for transit information is uh, our transit land um, site and, and team. Uh, their purpose is to form community relations with transit agencies and provide a one-stop shop where transit agencies can import, upload their general transit feed spec, GTFS specification data, and have it shared and analyzed and, and coordinated with other transit agencies. Um, it, we currently have nearly 300 agencies submitting feeds and more are being added each week. Uh, the Transitland team is a key part of the mobility team at MAPZEN. Uh, Drew Dara Abrams is the uh, visionary behind Transitland and leads now leads the product development at Mobility Team. Um, Megan Hayde is um, our urban planning and, uh, and analysis tools lead and did much of the UX and UI at Transitland. Ian Rees is um, our GTFS wizard. He imports, uh, forms the import pipeline, does verification, validation, and um, writes queries to support the various APIs that Transitland supports. And Alex Smith is our newest member. He works with the uh, route geometries and will be leading our efforts into use, using real-time GTFS, sorry. Our CEO, Randy Meach, often talks of the, the virtuous cycle of contribution and consumption of open data. Uh, this applies to OpenStreetMap very readily where editors can make changes and within minutes see those changes on maps and within routes we see those updates uh, on our site within a, within a day as we form daily updates. This also is important in the uh, transit import um, feed where one example was um, a, a hackathon in Rome led to uh, transit agencies forming and, and um, contributing their feeds into transit land now, transit, now those same transit land feeds are ingested into Valhalla for multimodal routing um, you know, and journey planning support. So Valhalla uses dynamic runtime costing during its route path determination. We feel this separates us from other open source routing solutions where the costs for each of the routing edges is baked into the graph during data import time. What we do is we store a lot of attribution per node and per edge and make decisions on whether um, you can actually travel through a particular node or down on a particular edge based upon the vehicle type and the, uh, the mode of travel. Um, we also uh, form costs based on attributes, uh, things like speed and distance, form time, but we can also use things like surface type, elevation factors, um, and, and, and other more complex costing factors to penalize things like penalized tolls and, and create routes of different characteristics. 
So our costing includes both an edge cost, the time or cost to traverse the edge of the graph between two intersections, but we also include a transition cost, which is the cost to go from one road to another through the intersection. And this transition cost can account for um, the types of roads that are at an intersection and the likelihood that you might have to stop, pause, wait, and then proceed on to the destination edge. And we can do things like cost left-hand turns higher than right-hand turns in U.S. and other countries where uh, driving occurs on the right. So in this GIF, you see an example where without the, inter the, tra the uh, transition costing, the shorter path is to make two left-hand turns. But when we introduce in the uh, transition costing, it is less cost to make two, two right-hand turns, even though it's a further distance. So we feel the, the uh, dynamic costing advantages offset the uh, added computational time. Uh, we feel this makes um, our, our system and our data more flexible in that we can use a simple da single data set to support multiple route types and route options. It's also very extensible. We can add in new, new costing modes and new um, options for existing costing modes to create routes of different characteristics. And bicycle routing is, is a great example of where dynamic costing really pays off. Uh, there are a lot of different types of bicyclists. They vary in their experience, their fitness level, um, how willing they are to you know, mix it up with traffic, so to speak, or you know, a lot of cyclists just want to stay on paths and, and avoid, avoid cars. Um, so we have a fairly um, sophisticated costing, uh, standard bicycle costing algorithm where we consider several options. We have the bicycle type, whether you're on a road bike, a city bike, a cyclocross bike, or a mountain bike, that will affect which types of roads and, and surfaces the, uh, the, the uh, bike route is, is allowed to take. We also have a cycling speed, which is the speed uh, the cyclist can generally travel on flat roads for a sustained time. We modify this speed with elevation factors, so it's slower going up a hill and faster going down a hill, uh, and also surface types. So by changing the speed, there, are, there can be some changes in the actual route path. But more changes come about due to a factor known as used roads, which is a factor from zero to one indicating how willing the cyclist is to, to use roads with traffic versus favoring paths and bike lanes and, and information like that. So an experienced cyclist who might want to you know, take roads and find the shortest time path would set the use roads factor to one, and an inexperienced cyclist might want to avoid those roads even at the cost of going a longer distance. The last factor is our elevation factor where we, um, during our data import, for each edge of the routing graph, we look up the elevation along that edge and provide a factor that is a sense of how much elevation change occurs along that, that edge and how much energy you might expend going from one point uh, or the one intersection to the next intersection along that edge. So what we can do is have routes that avoid hills, so to speak, and uh, take a longer distance, a longer path around a hill versus if you set a factor high enough, then it'll just go straight up over the hill because that's the fastest way. And this um, set of uh, images demonstrates some of our routing with the bicycle costing. This example is in DC showing the, the uh, path with use roads equals one, goes, takes surface streets in Northern Virginia with use roads equals zero. It takes a much longer path, but stays on the, uh, the bicycle paths. Second example is um, a mountain bike path, which um, if you set a road cycle, road bicycle, it will not actually route on this path. Uh, so you have to use a mountain bike. And here are two different factors of, of use hills. The first one 
um, took the shortest path and went up over steeper hill. The, longer, the other one was a longer path that avoided going up that steep hill. And the final one is just in downtown San Francisco, um, showing two different paths um, that, uh, you know, again, use the elevation factor. Within the bike routes, we also um, are showing the elevation in a, a chart on the left. We, we developed an elevation service that allows you to pass in the shape of the, of the route, the lat long positions, and then look up the elevation and generate that chart. Um, these slides are also demonstrating MapSend's new outdoor style, which has hill, hill shading and um, tends to focus on bike paths and bike lanes and you know, outdoor, outdoor type transportation. Another factor that differentiates Valhalla is our use of routing tiles. Uh, from day one, we came up with the idea of we should you know, segment the data into tiles like map data, and these tiles are different sizes. So we have local tiles, which have all the roads and paths. They are uh, about a quarter degree by a quarter degree, so they're small area. Then we move up to an arterial hierarchy, which removes the minor roads and paths, and these end up being larger area, but less, less roadways. And then finally, there's the highway tiles, which, uh, re which are basically motorways, trunk, and primary roads only, and they're much larger. And the gift to the upper right just you know, kind of illustrates how the routing proceeds near the origin and destination and any intermediate des uh, locations, it uses the local tiles, and then as it spreads out in, his, in its search, it <clears throat> transitions to the arterial tiles, and then finally, in between, it's you know, working only on the highway hierarchy. And this is pretty standard highway hierarchy methods used in, in um, many routing systems. We have also have a public transit layer, which we uh, ingest data from transit land, form the transit uh, edges and transit stops as the nodes, and then we connect those to the OSM-derived uh, walkable edges you know, on the local level. So why did we do this? Um, you know, one is reduced memory requirements and caching, but uh, kind of the primary long-term goal is to allow offline client-side routing. And just uh, last week or two weeks ago, City Maps announced with their iOS app that they support downloadable maps with on-device on routing, and they use Valhalla and um, and its routing engine. So. We haven't quite gotten to it, but one of our you know, open source users um, took it upon themselves within a couple weeks, was able to cross-compile Valhalla for use in iOS. And I believe that's, you know, this is one of the future of uh, you know, having route tiles, is being able to move the tiles onto device, not only doing on-device routing, but you can improve the whole navigation experience, things like making a better return to route, better, better determinations of when you're actually exiting a route if you have all, the, all of the road information at your disposal. So guidance and navigation is, is another one of our main, uh, main support, uh, main, main differentiators. Uh, we've worked a lot to focus our application and our service to support um, both narrative generation for textual display, but also navigation applications where uh, verbal cues um, are important. And um, I don't know how well you can see, um, see the text on the right, but this is some examples uh, from a route, and things like improved exit information appear. So on maneuver four, it says take exit 23B slash A on the right onto I-83 South toward Baltimore. That's pretty detailed information about that exit and that, that decision point. It's not just saying take the ramp on the right. It's you know, providing context and important information. Uh, we also have ramp fork information, so after you make that exit, the ramp actually splits, and the, the guidance tells you to keep left to take exit 23A onto I-83 South. So it further guides you onto the appropriate, onto the appropriate ramp. 
And the other thing is its support for um, verbal cues within the narrative. We support three different types that the, that the uh, service returns. A verbal alert is meant as a uh, alert to be given some time before the maneuver, maybe a minute or you know some time before the maneuver to kind of prepare the driver or, or user to actually make that make that decision. Then there's the verbal pre pre alert or the verbal pre guidance, which is the guidance that's given immediately before the maneuver. It has more details about you know the you know the uh, road name that's being turned on to and things like that. And then there's the verbal post maneuver, which does, is, is optional. It doesn't always get generated, but it would tell you things like continue on this road for 20 miles, or maybe the road name changes to become a U.S. highway, so it'll tell you to continue on U.S. Highway 30 for 30 miles, for instance. Um, another thing we've done is tailor the output towards text-to-speech. Um, synthesis, synthesis in the device. So, you know, I've worked with uh, mobile applications trying to do this, and there's always a lot of special case logic that you have to write into um, the, the application code for your device to make the uh, text-to-speech work properly. We've done some of that server-side, service-side, so things like spelling out abbreviations, I-83, in, a, in the verbal guidance becomes Interstate 83, similar for a lot of other um, abbreviations. We also format numbers, three-digit numbers especially, so 695 becomes 6 space 95, so the text-to-speech pronounces it as 695 rather than 695. So we have a blog. We have several blogs that discuss this. Dwayne Gerhardt's uh, written about it, presented about it at State of the Map. He's also worked with the OpenStreetMap community to um, define a lot of the exit information tagging that that is recommended. Um, and there were just some items on the OpenStreetMap talk this morning that that he uh, got into and responded. So he's working aggressively to improve that information. We're also working towards uh, globalization of our narrative, supporting multiple languages, and um, we have a tag-based JSON file with all the phrases that are used in our narrative and guidance, and that can be then translated into different languages. And this, to me, demonstrated the true power of open source, where we were developing these capabilities early this year, and then all of a sudden we had a, a user or someone we didn't even know uh, submit a, pr a pull request to GitHub with translations of our phrases for the Czech language. We'd not done any you know, requests for help. We hadn't even written instructions for how to do it. The, this gentleman actually was just following what we were doing and took it upon himself to figure it out and, and help us out. So that was great, and he continued to work with us to, to improve the... Um, the uh, Czech translation and, and, and improve the, the, the whole process. Um, so if anyone else in this room feels inclined to help out, uh, we have a site where you can, uh, can help out and, and do help us with translations. So uh, Valhalla is open source software. We have you know, many people who have downloaded it and made use of it locally, but we also package at maps and packages it package it into a service with an API documented um, and we have you know, you know, allow it for free use with um, fairly decent rate limits you know you can't run a you know consumer grade website with thousands of requests per minute but you can you know for most users you know doing small stuff it, it works pretty well um, so the, the site is mapsend.com projects turn by turn, and the uh, documentation site is under the documentation turn by turn. Um, it's a JSON interface, JSON inputs, JSON outputs. I like to call it BYOG, bring your own geocode. Uh, you have to provide a latitude longitude. You can't just enter an address and have us geocode it for you. Um, you know, we could, but that ends up you know, adding another variable into the whole equation, and, and we feel that it's better for 
users to be able to choose their search and geocoding method um, and then just send us the lat long. Um, and I believe there was a workshop yesterday, um, the Zero to Web Map, where um, the gentleman, uh, Will, from Army Corps of Engineers actually um, showed how to read the documentation, uh, add it to a JavaScript-based uh, uh, map, and um, was, he, he was pretty impressed how easy it was. So, so that was good news for us. So um, with our service, we also have some examples of how others might use that service within their applications. Uh, we tend to focus on mobile-based applications, and we've, we're developing uh, SDKs at MapZen. Um, last week at Samsung Developer Con Conference, um, MapZen, MapZen announced Android SDKs, which currently support search and mapping the um, turn by turn or routing uh, piece is, is currently in development, so you can expect that a little bit uh, toward later towards the summer. Um, and iOS is, um, a, uh, SDKs will follow soon after. We also have a reference application in mobile known as Eraser Map, which combines several of the maps and services, the, the uh, mapping. Uh, we use um, Tangram to uh, generate the maps and have a special style called Bubble Wrap, which um, looks good on the mobile mobile devices. Um, uses maps and search, and it uses maps and turn by turn, and it takes the response from from the routing uh, turn by turn, and displays it, and then allows you to drive along that route and shows uh, the maneuvers coming up, things like that. So it's a pretty good reference uh, navigation app. And um, it got its name because it's a privacy-based application. It's not tracking location, um, not logging information. Um, it, we honor the do not track, uh, track um, headers. And um, you know, there are a set of people who kind of are looking forward to a uh, application that's not always following you. Um, I guess, um, oh yeah, was la last thing was um, you can sign up for a developer key and try, try out uh, Maps and Turn by Turn. Thanks. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, if the edit is made in, oh, okay, he's wondering about dynamic updates um, so that, you know, if a uh, road is closed or something like that, how, do, how would we handle that? Um, with OpenStreetMap, if the data, if you make an edit in OpenStreetMap, it has to be, go through the whole update cycle, so we pull down updates from OpenStreetMap and then regenerate our, our routing tiles basically every 12 to 14 hours, so once to twice a day. Um, we are talking about um, how we might use temporary uh, speed data, like real-time da speed data or closures, um, and the thought there is we could have tiles of uh, override factors, you know, like, oh, you know, here's the real-time speed, and then have costing methods that would have that look into that tile, which could be rapidly updated. Um, Unfortunately, that's you know open source traffic data is kind of in the very nice you know early early stages of people thinking about it. Others, yes. Um, we actually. Um, Last year, when we uh, did this, we used SRTM and you know ingested it for our own uses. Uh, MapZen, working with Amazon, is doing a tiled elevation data set, and um, there should be more information about that this week. Um, so the plan would be to use that, as, um, and that that would 
fill in with higher detail, you know, at areas where, like, you know, 10 meter or, or whatever NED data would fill in. Right now, we're just using the SRTM, which is worldwide, but it's not as high, high resolution. Others? Well, thanks.